happy to be here in Nyack. And you might think that my shoes don't match. <laughs> I thought when they said break break the leg, they meant break the foot. So I did. <laughs> but anyway, I just want to tell you about one of my favorite subjects. The first time that I met Helen Hayes, I went to Nyack and I walked upstairs a little nervous and I saw this white sheet come floating down and it revealed this tiny little lady with a babushka. And she said, hello, darling. I hope you like strawberry shortcake, because that's what we're having for dessert tonight. And I said, strawberry shortcake? That's just my most favorite, favorite dessert in the whole world. Cleopatra, not the Elizabeth Taylor version, 
uh, the Helen Hayes version, <laughs> kind of a petite little Cleopatra, and she was just so heartsick that this wonderful, charming man wasn't calling. And one night, he came by the theater and knocked on her dressing room door and came in and said, I wondered if I could take you to dinner tonight. And she said, oh no. She said, my mother and I have rented a home in Long Island and, and there's a car waiting to take me. Would you like to come? And he didn't even get a toothbrush or a clean shirt. He was in that car going to Long Island. <laughs> And uh, she was renting that house with her mother, Brownie, who was known as Brownie, who was very much the stage mother. And she wasn't very happy that this known uh, fellow had uh, had a lot of, of rumors about him and his drinking and his womanizing had come and was sort of courting him. And one night they were sitting on the porch, you know, swing on the porch, and Charlie looked at Helen and said, you know, Helen, I want more than a stolen kiss. I want all of you. That was it. That was it. It started a romance that lasted three years because Charlie was married, but his wife wasn't giving him a divorce. He was separated. And it was heartbreaking to them. And the Algonquin round table that Charlie was a member of with Alec Wolcott and um, Robert Finchley and Dorothy Parker, whom he had dated before. And when he broke up with Dorothy Parker and went with B. Lily, <laughs> Dorothy Parker almost killed herself. He was so in love. She was so in love with him. And all of this, this incredible man, and they, and they were all saying, what is What's he doing with Helen Hayes, the gingham virgin? <laughs> and it, this is not a good match. This is not good at all. And, but they feel so in love, but he didn't want to get married. Well, first of all, he had to get divorced. He had to wait for that to happen. And even after that, he didn't want to be with a, someone who was such a, a brilliant actress and known. And he was a playwright, but not quite of the stature that Helen was. And then he and Ben Hecht, ben Hecht wrote the front page. And that night, it depended a lot on that show doing well as to whether Charlie would then be the young famous playwright and could be with the famous Helen Hayes. And it was a very nervous night, opening night, and Rose and Ben Hecht sat in the row next to Charlie and Helen. And so much depended on this play. And Ben and Charlie were just too nervous to sit through. So they decided to go out on the fire escape and wait. Well, the curtain opened, and it was one uproarious laugh after another. I mean, the audience loved the play. So at intermission, Helen ran out and yelled to the fire escape, it's a hit, it's a hit. And Charlie opened his arms and said, will you marry me, Helen? Jimmy, as I call him, 
was really Charlie's son, his biological son. There are so many different stories about this adoption. But looking at Charlie and knowing about Jimmy, biologically, genetically, I think there may have been a definite link. <laughs> and all I can say is what a wonderful woman that Helen was, if that is a true story, and it seems to be, that she took in Charlie's son. She loved Charlie so much. There was only one problem, and that was the drinking seemed to be always involved. And that was difficult. And then Mary was a lovely actress. And Charlie said to Helen, she's really good. So Helen invited her to be in a play with her in Westport, Connecticut. And during the run of the play, Mary got very lethargic and had a bad cold. And Helen didn't feel comfortable and thought she should go to New York and see the family doctor. And so she did, and Mary said to, to her mom, uh, I'll be back next week. And off she went, and Charlie called Helen and said, well, the doctor says she just has a cold and she's run down, but she'll be fine. A few days later, Charlie called Helen and said, it's serious, I think you better come. So she took Jack home, went straight to the hospital. And Charlie was sitting behind an iron mom. Mary had contacted polio. And one day, when she had had so many drugs, she looked at her mother and father and she said, hey, let's the three of us get out of here. And a few days later, she died. And it was, of course, so very sad. And Helen didn't want to go back to work. She thought people would feel sorry for her. And she was feeling very depressed and Charlie was drinking more. It was a very, very difficult time, as you can imagine. And she had letters. There was lots of publicity about it. She had a letter from President Eisenhower and a letter for Ellen or Roosevelt. And then, a few years later, she had a letter from Jonas Salk, who said, if it hadn't been for all the publicity about your Mary's death, I never would have raised enough funds to invent the polio vaccine. And Helen said, Mary's death then gave meaning. Because that's where I am all the time. 
and he did, and uh, he learned to be quite a good actor. And then he invited me home to Naya one weekend. And my mother said I could go to Naya, so I did.
you were going to go see Mrs. MacArthur, Jim's mom, in a play. I hope she was good. You know, and we sat in the third row, I remember, and I was holding Jimmy's hand, and the curtain came up, and she's knitting at the opening scene, and she looked out at us in the third row and winked. Oh. I thought this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> this, she's not in character. She doesn't know what she's doing. She is going to embarrass Jimmy so much. And I just took his hand like that. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry for you, Jimmy. <laughs> and then, as I watched the play, she literally became that woman in the play. I, I couldn't believe it. I was mesmerized. And after the show, Everybody went backstage, and we went to her dressing room, and there was Lunch and Fantana, and Laurence Olivier, and Arlene Dahl, and all of Broadway there, and they were all saying, oh, Helen Dahl, oh, that means oh, mother. And I said, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I went through the, and I looked at her, and I gave her a hug, and I said, you know what? You were good. <laughs> Sweep up a 
stage, right? So, that's easy enough. But a little nervous. So I'm doing the button, button, button. She's walking away, walking away from you. Then she makes her exit and she goes. <laughs> and I thought, why is she moving? Why is she moving? Why she keep going? She, why is she doing this funny thing like that? And then she turned around and she gave me a look to die and pulled. And I went ass over teacups. I was standing on her train. <laughs> but Jimmy did worse. He did much worse. He was playing her, whatever the people are who look after the queen. Uh, not a servant, but a bard or a whatever they're called. Anyway, he's all in uniform. She's all dressed like Queen Victoria. And he wheels her out in a wheelchair, turns her to the audience, and she gives her diamond jubilee speech, which is just marvelous. And she stops for a dramatic moment. And Jimmy started wheeling <laughs> <laughs> And all of a sudden, her heels dug in. I think it made skin marks on the stage. And Jimmy realized, whoops, turned her down. <laughs> and she finished her speech. <laughs> Needless to say, at the end of the play, Jimmy and I hid from her. <laughs> Somebody came in and said, Jim, um, would you come out, please? And he was telling Jimmy that his pop had passed away. And he left school, and they told me. And of course, I was terribly sad because I had met Charlie, and he had been so charming and nice to me. And I, I just felt so sad for Jimmy. I knew how close he was to his pop. So I was invited. And my mother and my dad were invited to go to Nyack to the funeral service. Well, first the funeral service in New York and then a reception in Nyack, a pretty penny. And when I got there, I saw Jimmy in his black suit and looking very sad in the midst of all these famous people. And I went right to him and I gave him a big hug. And he said, Mom wants to see you upstairs. And so I went upstairs and she was in bed. And I sat on the side of the bed, and I held her hands and said how sorry I was. And she said, I don't know, darling, but every time there's a tragedy in my life, I end up in bed with a cold. <laughs> a few months later, it was our senior prom. And there we are at our senior prom. And the summer before, Jimmy had done a television show on a TV show called Climax. And he, the name of the show was The Young Stranger, that episode. He was so good in it that they decided to make a movie of it. And John Frankenheimer, who big time director, this was his very first play, a uh, first screenplay. And he was, that, I was just so excited that Jimmy was asked to do a big movie. And he had done very well his senior year. He was going to go off to, to Harvard. And his mom bought him as a graduation present a black Thunderbird with red interior. And wow, is it sharp. And she wrote this letter to me. He was going to go off and be filming in Hollywood after we graduated. And she wrote, Darling Joyce, Every time I talk to Jim, I ask him about the chances of kidnapping you for the cross-country trip. This weekend is the first time he's held up any hope. So I'm charging in quick. We have to start, she was gonna drive with, behind Jimmy uh, with her housekeeper and the chauffeur. We have to start now on the 12th of, uh, or the 13th of June in order to get him to work on the 25th, the new day they have thrown at us from Hollywood. Could you make it? The route looks marvelous, and I, for one, would enjoy it much more if I could be seeing it with you. Of course I can't vouch much for Jim. <laughs> Come on out one weekend soon with your mom so we can all talk. Love, Jim's mom. Well, my mother said I could go. <laughs> Because a lot of the MacArthur family lives in Chicago. 
and we visited Uncle Alfred and Aunt Mary, and then one day Helen took me shopping at Marshall Field. And as we were going along looking something, this, this one lady said to Helen behind the counter, I know who you are. You're somebody, aren't you? <laughs> and Helen said, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. So we went into the millinery department. We were trying on hats and being silly. And she said, I, I, I know you're somebody. I know who you are. I know who you are. You, you, you're Lillian Gish. <laughs> she said, I am not. I'm Helen Hayes. Come, Joyce. <laughs> so, off we went. I don't know why my throat's so dry. It's not dry here like in Colorado. <laughs> so we went off, and uh, on the road, um, we stopped at Yellowstone, and she had asked me if I would do some recordings for her. She was recording, uh, I think it was Lux, uh, theater. And so I was operating the, the recording uh, equipment and we stopped in Yellowstone in this big log cabin lodge they had there and you could hear every sound from the, every room. But, so we were recording and all of a sudden in a very important moment you'd hear flush, <laughs> flush and we, we got the giggle. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we went um, Hmm. One day we were driving, it was raining, and all of a sudden I heard Helen singing, just softly. There's a somebody I'm longing to see, I hope that he turns out to be someone to watch over me. And a big tear coming down her cheeks. And I reached over and held her hand. And I knew she was missing her Charlie. And we drove through the rain the rest of the day. And then we got to Pismo Beach. And on Pismo Beach, we stayed in this really run-down motel. And I remembered hearing that Helen and Charlie had spent a lot of time up the hill at Hertz Castle with uh, Walter for William Warner. What's his name? Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Myrna, Myrna Lowe. And uh, they would, I mean, Charlie Chaplin would be up there, and oh, they'd be eating dinner of the finest china and drinking out of beautiful Baccarat crystal. And here we were in this dumb little motel, and Helen was having her bourbon mist in a paper cup. <laughs> what a come down, what a mom. <laughs> And then we went on to San Francisco, where she took me to my first nightclub woo, to see Mort Saul. That was fun. Then we drove on down the coast and ended up in Hollywood. Oh my, it was just, it just was amazing to be in Hollywood. 
Bali and the Bali's people like that. And then she took us to the set, and I can't remember which set it was, but that was Michael Rennie, a very, very, very famous director, producer. I don't know his name. <laughs> and then Helen, and that's me, and that's uh, Kenny Cromwell, and Flutie Glenn, who lived in Nyack, right across the street from Jimmy, and they were best friends. And then Helen took me to Joan Crawford's house. I mean, I'm going to meet Joan Crawford. I mean, I just sort of seen her across the room at the party. But uh, we went in there, rang the bell, the door opened, and obviously the housekeeper with her hair all tied up and a seersucker shirt and a, a mop in her hand. And I thought, oh, uh, hello. And, and Helen said, Joyce, I'd like you to meet Miss Crawford. <laughs> Joan Crawford. And she took me by the hand and took me just without a word, running up these stairs into a dressing room full of mirrors, and then opened this big door, double door, to a room with shoes, all shoes. And, and she said, what do you think? And he said, that's a lot of shoes. <laughs> I don't know what I was supposed to do. <laughs> but Hollywood was quite something. And then it was time to fly home. I was going to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, and Helen was going off to London to film Anastasia. And she wrote this letter. My darling little roommate, London is exciting and so far pretty exhausting, seeing so many old friends in a great rush and trying to crowd everything into a week because I shall start shooting, that means working, in the picture this coming Monday. And after that, I shall be locked up in the studio every day. I've spent a couple of days at the studio so far, visiting with my fellow actors in Anastasia. It was good to see Ingrid Bergman, again, more beautiful than ever. Yul Brynner is still bald. <laughs> Mark, he'll have to spend the rest of his film career like that. <laughs> Along with playgoing and costume fitting and shopping, I've been doing a lot of sightseeing. I find these rich historical spots irresistible. I wish you were here to share the fun with me. I really miss you. Write me your news to the above address. Love to all, Jim's mom. <laughs> Susan Strasberg came to me and asked me 
if I uh, would talk to Richard because he was stealing my laugh at the end of the second act. And could you talk to him about it, Helen? And Helen said, well, darling, we were having an affair. Uh, you're a lot closer to him than I am. <laughs> and why don't you discuss it with him? And she said, oh, you think I should? She said, yes, why don't you do it during the, between the matinee and evening performance? <laughs> and, uh, so she said, okay. So Helen, usually between matinee and evening, she'd have a cot in her dressing room and she'd take a nap. And she'd turn on the radio so she didn't hear Susan and Richard in the next room. And um, <laughs> so this day, she decided not to take a nap and not to turn the radio on. And she got a glass and she took it out, <laughs> put it against the wall. And she said, she heard the door open and she heard Susan say, oh, Richard, darling, oh, come on, oh, Richard, oh, Richard, I like to talk about that, oh, darling, oh, oh Richard, oh, And then so it's the first time she ever literally heard someone get screwed out of a laugh. <laughs> Germany. That's Helen and me 
and her good friend and actress <coughs> Bill Bunty. And oh gosh, it was so cold. We stayed at the Marisha Hoff Hotel in München. And I couldn't believe I was in Europe. And there I was with Helen, and we were just so close. And it was freezing cold. And we got under the covers, I remember, with sweaters on and everything, ordered hot soup from room service, and just shook. And then during the day, we wandered the streets of Munich, looking in the candy shops, with their nose pressed against the glass. We both had a weakness for candy. And then we'd look at the black and tree. It was all wonderful. And we went to Rodenberg and had a grand time. And then Bunty told the story about one day she was English, she was at a stop sign in London, and she looked over, and there was Winston Churchill in the back of the limousine. And she got so excited to see Winston Churchill, and before the light could change, she went, and he went. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so we were 
Pope told him to get up and go over to the altar, and the little Pope and all his wife, with all the cardinals in their red, suddenly turned and came right towards us. Not us, me. He came right towards me. And there we were in the old black mountain, and I fell down on my knees and I kissed that ring so hard, I almost swallowed it. <laughs> and then he turned and walked away. And I thought, oh, poor Helen, goody. You know, I think he thought I was Helen Hayes. I think. Anyway, it was quite thrilling. And, and Helen didn't hold it against me, thank you. <laughs> so then so he drove us on down the boot to Siena and then to Naples, where we were going to. Helen and I were going to take the ship home, doing a crossing across the Atlantic, and uh, Jimmy sent us a telegram, and it said, Bon voyage and love to my two favorite ladies. This is the captain's dinner, and I'm wearing one of the dresses that Helen had, she had several of her dresses altered for me to wear on the trip. It was so nice. They were beautiful, beautiful dresses. And this is one of them I'm wearing. It's a beautiful blue and white chiffon dress. And then we got to New York City. And here we are on the front page. And underneath it said, getting to know her. Play, and now I was doing an off-Broadway play 
called um, Whisper to Me. And this is Helen, opening night of my play, and she wrote, Happy first step on the starway to the stars, Mom. Ah, there it is. <laughs> and uh, then Jimmy got another Disney play, a, a movie, uh, called uh, Swiss Family Robinson. And it was on an island in Tobago. And we were there for six months. And everybody was being so creative in the movie, and Jimmy was being creative. So I decided to be creative, and along came Charlie. <laughs>
thing about nothing but you four beautiful beings. No, five, because even Timmy gets into the act. That was their job. <laughs> I'm calling tonight to see it comes, how it comes out, the homecoming. How happy you have made me. How I love you, Mom. <laughs>
didn't know about the disease of alcoholism, and, and I was very codependent and had a big ego, thinking my love could cure somebody of a disease like that, but that didn't happen. And I um, wanted to make things as easy as I could with this whole thing. And Jimmy's lawyer said that it would look better for Jimmy if I took the children and left. And I, I took their, their furniture from their room and their toys and their pictures. And I took one bed from the guest room for me and put it all in the gardener's truck. And we drove off one day and leaving our house behind. And we moved to a little house in the valley. Enough nerve 
to go visit Helen, who was a little frail at the time, to ask her if I could possibly have Mary's engagement party in the garden at Nyack. I said, you know, when I was pregnant, and I look at that wonderful Renoir painting of the girl in the straw hat that hung in her living room, I said, I always imagined that Mary would look like that, and one day she would have her engagement party in your garden. I said, now, I don't want you to worry about anything if, if it's okay. She said, you really want to do that? And I said, well, I thought that all your friends in New York and Nyack could come be part of the wedding because it's going to be in Colorado, and this will give you a chance to celebrate. And she got terribly excited, you know, and I said, if you're not feeling well, I, I said, first of all, you don't have to do anything. I will get the caterer, I will arrange absolutely everything, and if you don't feel up to it, I understand, and you can just watch the proceedings from your dressing room upstairs. And she said, oh, I'm so excited. She said, this is wonderful, darling. She said, now what am I going to wear? And she said, I'm just going to fly everyone in for the party. And she was so excited about it, and I, my heart was just full. And, and then she, I, I said, no, I don't want to keep you any longer, you know. And so uh, she said, well, I'll see you to the door. And I said, no, 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 I know where it is. And we started walking to the living room. She said, I want to go with you. And I, we're arm in arm. And as we walked by this little table, there was a little angel on it. And she picked up the angel and she said, Joyce, I want to I give this to you. But I can't because someone gave it to me. And she put it back down. <laughs> I had given it to her. <laughs> <laughs> I 
like diamonds. A young priest who had been with her in the last days of her life came up to me and said, Joyce, wait, wait. He said, Helen wanted to tell you, me to tell you that she felt so bad about how she treated you at times, but she wanted you to know that she loved you very much.